Uh, my name is Corey Petty. I'm going to talk about how to ethically build public good infrastructure, um, specifically focusing on the ethics. It's not going to be as many details. If you'd like more details on kind of uh, our history and the current work we do uh, at Status and uh, sister organizations, you can, I'd recommend watching Oscar Thorne's talk he did earlier today. So if you missed that, check it on the stream. Um, but for those of you who are leaving, if you want a TLDR, uh, assholes exist. Uh, Web3's main primitive is to minimize their influence on everyone else. That's the whole goal, I think, that what we're trying to do in building decentralized technology is uh, mitigating those with power and their influence on those without it. And the ethics of building this stuff, this infrastructure, has a massive impact on our su success in doing this. So the process of um, how we think about building these things and how we make decisions in the process of building these things tremendously uh, impacts our ability to mitigate assholes. So, a little bit about me. My name is Corey Petty, I said that at the beginning. Um, I started out doing podcasting in early 2015 and research a couple years before that. Um, joined Status four to five years ago, it's a blur at this point, doing security research and uh, security stuff across the organization. And since this year, I've moved into doing uh, kind of coordinating all of the infrastructure projects which we've recently expanded into. And you'll see kind of uh, a start to that work uh, in the later half of my, of my talk. And you can reach me in all these different things, corepetty.eth on status, just search for Petty and uh, corepetty on Twitter. So, status is an organization that's founded on a series of principles. We wholly bought into uh, what we believe to be like the ideal Ethereum principles for building public good infrastructure. Uh, I'm not going to list them all, you can see them. And in some cases, these things are a little in conflict with each other, but as an organization that's founded on these things, they serve really, really, really well as uh, how we argue about trade-offs when implementing things or developing things or trying to understand how we'd like to do it. And I'm going to do the normal thing where I give you the Wikipedia definition of something, and that's public good infrastructure. And that's a good in which all enjoy in common in the sense that each individual's consumption of such a good leads to no subtractions from any other individual's consumption of that good. And this is Paul Sanderson. So we're trying to optimize uh, uh, infrastructure where it's not a zero-sum game uh, and someone can't take advantage of others or in the process of someone being successful, it doesn't detriment the uh, use or experience of someone else that uh, has nothing to do with that work. But, as I said earlier, assholes exist. There are always people who seek to profit for themselves on behalf of others because they don't care or they don't know. Um, and our goal, like I said in the beginning, is to mitigate that influence as much as possible. And I've come up with somewhat of a law. I'm sure this is something more general and formal somewhere else, but every community has assholes. There's always someone in a community that uh, cares more about themselves than the others, uh, is willing to do things on be, uh, for themselves uh, to the detriment of others. And as things grow, the likelihood of these things also grow. And more often than not, these people are usually very loud. Now, what a community is, is as generic as you could think it would be. It's either a blockchain ecosystem, uh, a government, your local meetup, your friends group, whatever. We all know kind of uh, who this person is. And I imagine there's probably a lot of assholes in this building as well. So, like, we all kind of get the idea. Here's some. Uh, this is an example of what the influence of power dynamics can have on a system in which uh, tries to mitigate it, but doesn't quite successfully do so. And I want to make it a point that we're not seeking to remove power dynamics. That's kind of a natural thing across society. We're humans. Uh, the world is unfair. We each start off with a different set of uh, circumstances, and we, we change differently. But uh, we're really trying to flatten its effects. We're seeking to remove the ability some, of someone with asymmetric power to impact those without it. And this can be summarized by uh, this kind of change of phrasing. We've all heard in the beginning of Google uh, their, their phrase of don't be evil. And we loved it. We, that was one of the reasons why I enjoyed Google in the beginning was they had this kind of ethos and motto of like seeking to not uh, try and take advantage of others in the process of uh, building on infrastructure and serving people. Uh, and I have to give credit to Dr. Maniv Ali 
for introducing this exact phrasing to me back in, I don't know, one of the early consensuses in New York is, and what we're trying to do is change don't be evil to can't be evil because we've seen what happens when the motto is don't be evil. You have the option to do so. It's, it, it, and you continue to have that option. You get to selectively choose when it's economically feasible for you to not be evil or maybe there's a change of guard and uh, everything that's set up that had that ethos changes when uh, that new change of regard doesn't really quite care the way the original one did. So we're seeking to do this. Don't, changing don't be evil to can't be evil. Don't give people those options. And this is an example of when that fails. Uh, this is a mevwatch.info, I believe. Yeah, I think so. And this is what's currently happening as the, as the, as the result of the sanctions being put down on Tornado Cash. Now, uh, I'm not going to opine on the original picture of someone being held captive for, in prison for a long period of time. Uh, but what we can see is that Tornado Cash was sanctioned. The code was removed uh, and put back on subsequently. But uh, we're seeing OFAC sanctions having an, a, a, an impact on what we thought was uh, central, like censorship-resistant technology, where this is the list of all of the blocks currently done since the merge. And those of the, uh, and if you look at the, the gray here, the gray is all the ones that are not using a service from the validators called MEV Boost. And those that are, are the ones that are, uh, uh, the portion of those blocks that are OFAC compliant. They're censoring transactions on the public, on the, on the uh, public Ethereum blockchain in compliance with these tornado cast sanctions and the ones that aren't. And I think if you look at that, it ends up being uh, quite a bit. So 32 of all transactions put across the, uh, the, uh, the blockchain network are, are OFAC compliant. And if you look at just the ones going on through MEV, MEV Boost, the massive majority of those are. So we're seeing censorship at the base layer. And this can only be done because we can see what those transactions are. Um, and you're able to make a distinction and do transaction ordering because you're able to see those details. Now, that means you're given the ability, if we look back here, maybe, you have the ability to make a decision. That you're, you're choosing don't be evil and not can't be evil. So it makes, it, it, it's showing that we need more privacy and censorship resistance. Well, I'll get to that in a moment. Don't know why that moved. Yeah, so we're seeing that we need more privacy and censorship resistance at lower and lower layers. Um, if we can't just do everything on the blockchain layer and then ignore it on the ones below. And if you looked at the talk before this, you see that like, that's a really hard problem to solve. There's a lot of like, trade-offs and difficulties you have to do to try and figure out what is good behavior and how do we make the appropriate trade-offs to then maximize that, right? So uh, I'm going to take a slight turn here to talk about kind of how you can maybe think about structuring this argument and um, where it actually comes into place when you're making decisions on uh, like how to build infrastructure and, and where you need to focus your, 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 uh, your principles. So this, this, I keep coming back to this phrase, the medium is the message, and it's a general idea that uh, the technology you use, the medium, has a drastic impact on your ability to convey a given message. When we try to put something out, some idea in the world, uh, we think about it in our heads, we form it in some way, and we send it out into the world via some technology or formalism or whatever, and it's up to the receiver to uh, decode that appropriately. And it's also, in, while in transit, potentially being manipulated. And, and that's where a lot of that's coming in. I'll make a kind of a case for that in a moment. But this wonderful picture by Monica and the crowd here uh, is, is, is kind of like this example of what it looks like when you, you don't take this into account and you funnel everything, all human relationships, into a single medium in which kind of takes out all your optionality and how you can build things. So this is kind of like uh, all of the complexity of human relationships and different things coming through what I would see a meat grinder where everything comes out uniform and the same. Currently, this is what I would consider centralized infrastructure in which we try and take everything that we humans do to communicate and make digital relationships and lives uh, and what it turns out to be when we try and like mimic that stuff in a digital environment. So to dive into that a little bit deeper, there are three parts, three layers of any message. Uh, I want to try and explain what these are and then point out kind of where the subtlety and the evil comes in. First, we have the frame message. 
which is the concept of uh, giving information that it, there is a message. It says, hey, I'm a message. Decode me if you can. It's the ability to identify that a message even exists for you to think about. Uh, and it's, 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 it implicitly conveys in the structure of this message. This is a book. So you know what a book contains a message. Um, that's a good, decent example. And to understand the frame message is to recognize the need for some type of decoding mechanism. I've identified that there is a message, and now I need to find a way to decode it to understand what that message actually is. The next one is the outer message, which is the medium used to convey that message. This is how the message was sent out in the world. To understand this, the outer message is to build or know how to build the correct decoding mechanism for the inner message. So this is, I've identified that there's a message that I'd like to see, and now I need to understand that uh, how can I take this message and understand what the intent of this thing is. And then finally, the inner message, which everyone kind of understands, which is the initial intent being conveyed in the first place. So understand this is to have extracted that meaning that was intended by the sender in the first place. Now this is a overly simplistic model of what any message is, um, but it gives you a framework to kind of give you a, to an idea of like where things can be introduced and how to start trying to understand how you can mitigate these things. So uh, if we think about blockchain networks as coordination mechanisms, this is, the, we're using them as social layers to then, as I said er, earlier, mitigate assholes as best we can and trust a system as opposed to humans to convey those, those interactions. Uh, and the interesting thing about them that's different from the internet is that they have real-world value, which attracts a lot of people to do things that are very greedy. Uh, so we have these beautiful cross-border, cross-jurisdictional uh, attempts to be, attempting to be central, uh, censorship resistant coordination mechanisms that allow us to do all these things we couldn't do beforehand in a digital environment with digital relationships with real world value. Um, and if we think about that earlier framework of thinking about a message, it's really hard because it's layered in a bunch of different ways. If we look at the kind of stack, the very, very overly simplistic stack of what a blockchain network is, we have networking at the bottom. This is how messages get passed around to then everyone who's contributing to these things kind of comes to agreement and has all the right data to figure out what's going on. They then go through the process of validating all these messages to say if they're well-formed or someone's doing a double spin or they get dropped or whatever, uh, and then construct them into blocks. And then we go through a consensus mechanism where we, as a distributed system, come to agreement like this is all the right one to then move on to, onto from now on, right? And after that, we have to find some way of like extracting that data from this massive blockchain that we keep building. That's a lot of messages and a lot of different mechanisms which have what would be considered an outer message that needs to be interpreted appropriately. And based on anyone in this process's ability to understand that outer message and the powers they have in various places across the stack, give them the ability to change that message or censor it. And most of the time, when we're thinking about adding security or privacy, we're looking at the top two. In, in, val in validation and consensus, we're basically just making sure it's correct. But what we're seeing now, we, like, we spent all our time on privacy and the retrieval and kind of, well, there's a middle layer with smart contracts and so on and so forth. We're seeing all of our time spinning up here when, when things happen and those that, the powers that be want to change stuff, they go to a layer above because we didn't necessarily think about it back then, right? So that's kind of an overview of like, kind of how to think about uh, public good infrastructure, its complexity, and um, a ex small example of, I don't want to say not thinking properly or building improperly, but like as this thing has grown and ossified, the interactions of not incorporating what I would consider the strongest point, the strongest principles that we set out to do, mitigating assholes properly at the, at the, lower, layer, at the lower layers. We look to scale things too quickly. And in, instead of uh, providing what I think is a more fundamental requirement in order for self-sovereignty, and that is privacy, uh, and censorship resistant, we're failing to do so now in the system that's actually being adopted by many people. So, quick history of Whisper and how we've moved from the Arlen Relay and kind of statuses and now back in Waku's uh, attempts at trying to take infrastructure and grow it in the direction that it needs to grow while keeping all these principles aligned. Um, once again, there's a lot more details to all of this. I'd recommend 
reading the, the ridiculous amount of stuff we have online and watching Oscar's talk previously. Here's one tomorrow where he gives a, an awesome demo of what I'll get to eventually. Please show up for that. But this is an, what a, the original Ethereum uh, announced to the world. This is what the decentralized stack looked like where you had smart contracts on Ethereum. We all kind of know what that is. And then Swarm and Whisper, which were the other two pillars of what a decentralized application was supposed to be. Swarm for file storage and Whisper for dynamic communications or ephemeral communications. And with a special emphasis in obfuscating the route of uh, how, who sent a message and uh, who's receiving it. We wholly bought into this as status. And we wanted to build an application. We wanted to be this thing that consumed these things so that people had access to it in resource constrained or like areas in which only had access to small, low number of resources like the mobile phone, right? We wanted to increase the inclusion as much as possible while maintaining this uh, high level of decentralization. And we had this concept of socioeconomic networks really, really, really early. You're seeing a lot of social token stuff happen and kind of the idea of that Ethereum is a coordination layer. We're moving past this financial applications only situation. And so we incorporated Whisper. We used what was put out by Ethereum ecosystem. Um, and we did it naively, I'd say. We used proof of work, because that's part of it in terms of the, the anti-spam mechanism for um, messages being passed on the network. And we killed batteries and hit super hot phones. We used gossip, bloom, uh, gossip and bloom filters for sending it for sending MIDI, and we destroyed data plans for people, right? We tried to use this technology as best we could. And granted, it was a new technology, and we tried to apply it in a very extreme place. And then for discovery, for finding peers, and we had a, based on the high churn of people's mobile devices popping in and out of places or turning them off and so on and so forth, it's really hard to get, get good message reliability. And so what did we do? We took ownership of it because Whisper wasn't, Whisper wasn't being developed and applying resources. They, reasonably speaking, had a tremendous amount of work to be applied to just fixing and making the blockchain scale itself and solving those problems with what resources were available at that time. So Oscar, wrote a blog here, Long Mint. We, we decided as an organization to take ownership of this and introduce Waku, which was a fork of Whisper. And we tried to make it a little more scalable, a little more usable so that status applications, uh, uh, the users of the status application could have somewhat of a reasonable uh, user experience. So we attempted to patch Whisper for our Edge environment, took responsibility, and applied attention to our required infrastructure. And we did this in an open way. Um, we created VAC, which is a separate organization to focus and research and study on trying to grow these things in the manner that's appropriate with the principles I talked about in the beginning. And for all of these things, you can see out in the open, we try to make open specifications that anyone can use. Whisper, or Waku, is for everyone. We're taking opinionated versions of it and applying it in context we think is appropriate. But it's for everyone. A public good is not to be owned by a given organization and used at uh, our discretion. So we publish all these things at rfc.vac.dev, join, opine, contribute. Um, but we had issues. We had spam. For those of you who have used status in the past couple years, and you go to maybe the status channel, you're going to see a lot of this. Why? Because we had no incentives. We took away our ability to um, mitigate some of that with proof of work, because there are a lot of other issues with using proof of work for spam mitigation. Uh, but we had a problem. What, 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 could we, what, what could we have done to fix this? We could have offered up a lot of centralized solutions by looking at IPs and banning them or um, running things through our servers and censoring things appropriately, but we tried to stick to our principles of what a real decentralized stack should look like. And it was painful. But we had a scaling problem too. We had multiple problems simultaneously. So what did we do? We, cho we chose to, a plan for Waku, Waku 2 because the way Whisper was built, was fragile and couldn't scale, and we realized that when we tried to fix it. So we wrote it completely from scratch off of lib P2P and called it Waku V2. That's why we call it the spiritual successor of Whisper. So what do we do? We did a complete retooling of a private decentralized general messaging stack on top of lib P2P. Uh, it's modular so that users trying to use this stuff for a specific context can make the decisions that's appropriate for what they're doing. Uh, Whenever you try and make a completely generalized sol solid framework that isn't flexible, you're going to optimize for no one. Uh, so if you, but if you will provide a suite of protocols that work well together and a way for them to interact together, then you can hopefully build multiple solutions that optimize for multiple applications. 
Uh, and it's open, once again. It's built for generalized messaging. It's not just for status. That's one of the applications we use it for. We can use it for things based on what choices you make in the suite of protocols. Still spam, right? Still got problems with spam. We just dealt with scaling and getting people to use it and understanding that like, there's a lot of different ways you can do generalized chat, and we're not going to tell you how to do it. So in order for keeping with our principles, we decided to build the, what's called the RLN relay. And that is a privacy-preserving spam protection um, that leverages zero-knowledge proofs, and Shmir secret sharing, and some economic disincentives. Uh, this is built on Waku V2 Relay, and this is an, uh, I'm not going to go through the overview, I don't have much time, um, but uh, it's a really interesting way of using novel cryptography and uh, very well-known cryptography in a, in a unique combination of uh, allowing people to contribute to a network and be removed if they do bad behavior without having to re uh, reveal a lot of PII information about themselves and so on and so forth. So we stuck to our principles. It was painful along the way, but we got to a unique solution that I don't think ever would have gotten to, or maybe much later, had we just, you know, c compromised those things and moved on to some, some other way. All of the specifications, once again, are at rfc.vac.dev. You can see the papers of these things. Um, I'm sure there's links on, on vac.dev, but you can find them here. Uh, if, yeah, it's easier if you just go to the website and click on it as opposed to trying writing it down now. Uh, go play with it. Tell us about it. Uh, we have a lot of different other research along the way. Once again, go see Oscar. You can see a live demo of this type of thing. Live? A video of a demo of this type of thing tomorrow. Uh, and so once again, wrapping up. So our principles are a priority, right? In order to do what I would consider public good infrastructure, you need to publish openly. You can't do things in the dark. Uh, especially when it's a digital permissionless system. You can't have trust in things if you don't know how it works. And these things too should be community-based. So publish openly, implement, iterate. The concept of using old to tools will lead to old solutions. If we would have compromised on our principles and done things to make status scale and kind of uh, soar quickly, we would have just ended up with the same stuff, the same shit we have today. And that's not why we're here in the first place. Assholes are everywhere, and think about that. Think about how they can manipulate the intended messages that you're trying to send out in the world. Where can they understand the outer message of what you're trying to do, manipulate it, and change that message such that the receiver either can't get it or get something wrong? And uh, in general, I think it's important to uh, finish on, we should be conforming technology to relationships we're trying to have with the people we're trying to have them and not the other way around. Um, and we're building a lot of this. We've since expanded the organization substantially to start growing infrastructure. Uh, and we want to do that with as much of the principles and ethos that we started talking about in the beginning. And that's uh, collectively built to distributed media access, specifically network level privacy. You can't have censorship resistance if people can see what you're doing. So as much privacy as possible with selective disclosure in the right places. Heterogeneous multi-chain network. Uh, you need the right to exit. You shouldn't be beholden to a single place in which you shove things and then rely on them to work appropriately. Uh, native, private, public smart contracts. Once again, privacy at all levels of the stack. And as much as we possibly can, optimizing for resource-restricted devices, because you can't be inclusive if people can't get access to the devices that are required to use your software or hardware or whatever. This is what we're doing. There's a lot of work to be done, and we're hiring. This is a QR code to go to a lot of the jobs that we've posted currently. Keep track of it. There's going to be a lot more. Thank you. And since we're the last ones, we have a lot of questions. There's plenty of time for questions. I'm happy to take them. Yeah, take as much time as you want, Corey. Yeah. We're looking. Uh, are there any? I'm looking. Uh, where's the There's a question over there. Oh. Hey, uh, great talk. Um, Allow me to stand. Uh, so I was curious, you know, you talk about your principles, um, and it seems like first and foremost, privacy is at the top of that stack. Uh, I think there was like an implication about the morality of the OFAC uh, sanctions, like in the validators, um, which seems to imply that privacy is paramount above the other principles that you, you try to present as like uh, what is ethical for status. 
Uh, that's not a judgment, that's just, I'm just trying to say that. Uh, the, the question is, how do you prioritize the principles against each other? I mean, you talk about inclusivity, uh, like with the resource, uh, limited devices, um, and then how do you, you know, ask your community to input their opinions about, uh, like, the priorities of those principles? So in designing, you know, the future of status, like, what sort of processes do you use to get feedback? Uh, on those principles? Good question, actually. Um, it's really, really, really hard. Uh, first off, I think it's that, and Oscar Saki mentioned something that I've, I've, I like repeating and I like saying a lot because it really tells uh, kind of how to, like, a general idea of how to, how to frame these things. And, like, because at the end of the day, there's a lot of principles to uphold, right? A lot of ideas we want to try and do simultaneously that, in, in some situations, in a lot of situations, come in conflict with each other. Uh, but you can't build a decentralized framework on top of a centralized foundation. But you can do the opposite really easily. Coinbase is a wonderful example of that. Um, and so when you're thinking about having one of these arguments and trying to come to a, a priority, which is going to be context specific, you need to try and um, see what's most important and what removes your ability to uh, have that decentralized foundation uh, that can be compromised with at a later, at a, at a higher, at a higher, at a later, at a later place. Because we don't want to make decisions for other people. So how can we make the most generalized way that people can make decisions for themselves and and build appropriately for their context? So that means privacy is very strong because you're not revealing information until you need to. But if you're not private, you're automatically giving all that information away which allows people to make decisions, like, which, which doesn't allow people, you can't add, it's so hard, much harder to add privacy later. So the same thing, you can't build private solutions on top of public solutions. There, there's always going to be a way to remove that privacy to layer below and go after it, right? And I think like, uh, one of the examples I've heard uh, recently is uh, from our founder is like, say you wanted to build a limited liability DAO. How can we do that today? I don't think so, because if you make a vote on a specific proposal and someone doesn't like it, they can still see who voted on it and the whales and go after those. So like there's no removal of risk in the process of contributing to something like, like, like that because they just go after you. And you can just, the, 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 the lower you go, the more often that happens. So like it's like kind of long-winded answer to your question. You have to try and have arguments that move towards a direction of uh, what constraints are we applying now that are going to have implications in the layers above and is that in line with the people's ability to make decisions for themselves? Um, you, you mentioned uh, you can build uh, private solutions on public infrastructure. I'm wondering, what do you, what's your opinion on uh, rollups then, and ZK applied? They are beholden to whatever constraints that Ethereum gives them. They don't have a lot of power in themselves, and I really don't enjoy, like, although zero knowledge is wonderful, it's currently being used for compression reasons, and there's no privacy there. And once again, same thing, you're just even higher above the stack. Uh, since you're publishing all that data to the blockchain um, in a non-privacy preserving way, it's not doing anything, it's just a scaling solution. Uh, so it's, it's adding additional constraints that will eventually be subject to the same censorship resistance, like non-censorship resistance we're seeing today. But that being said, it's awesome. Like there's a bunch of really cool technology being deployed and very, very novel uh, advancements in cryptographic primitives that will be useful for scaling and adding privacy-preserving solutions in, in, in different ways in the future. So, like, I'm happy we're able to start to serve the amount of people that starts to compare to where we set it out in the first place, of, like, blockchain serving the world. But if we keep moving in this direction, it may become so ossified that we can't make solutions that keep it from being censorship-resistant which is what I said in the first, because the whole point of all of this, if we build blockchains that are not censorship resistant, then we didn't do anything we set out to do, other than making, I don't know, digital fund money. I'd like to give the biggest applause we have of the day, because it's the last speaker. Corey, thank you so much.